Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high quality website or blog. Plus, more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs with automatic device scaling. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE8. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 89. I'm Tom Merritt. Howdy, folks. I'm Brian Brushwood. And that was the trailer to A Boy and His Dog. Was that the official ex- movie release trailer, Brian? It, it is. Yeah, no, that's like not even, that's not even like, I know what you're going to say. You're going to be like, Brian, that's copyrighted. We can't put copyrighted stuff on our show. Brian, that's I, copyrighted. We can't put copyrighted stuff on our show. Aha! I knew you'd say that, which is why I grabbed it from archive.org. Do you know that the whole movie for A Boy and His Dog is available for free on archive.org and is totally copyright free? You can do whatever you want with it. It's just found footage to play with. Tell me more later in the show. (laughs) It was actually, it was uh, Don Johnson's first movie and it had, I forget the famous guy who voiced the the brain of the psychic dog, Uh, but it was uh, was, a... very bizarre avant-garde movie in the late 70s and a lot of the mo- the video game Fallout series owes a spiritual debt to some of the imagery that came from A Boy and His Dog. We'll have more details on how you can get crazy stuff like that legally for free later in the show, uh, but we should welcome our guest in uh, waiting patiently in the UK, Andy Armstrong, technical architect for live media streaming at the BBC joining us. Welcome Andy. Hello chaps. Hey, thanks uh, for staying up and joining us. Oh, no problem. I'm a, a late kind of guy, so that's all right. I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, we should say that this actually goes right with our first big story, which is about the streaming of the Olympics. This just in, the big story. Now, you say you're a stay-up-late kind of guy. I imagine you had some late nights recently after <laughs> yes. two weeks of streaming 2,500 minutes of the Olympics. Yeah, I tell you what, guys, I, I wept during the opening ceremony, and I don't think it was just the um, the spectacle of the thing, you know, because it, it actually worked at that stage. <laughs> it, was, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't inevitable, really, that it was going to work. Now, you um, know, it's uh, funny, when I mentioned uh, before the show to uh, Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theatre Geeks, that we had uh, a guy from the BBC coming on, he's like, well, you should ask him about their change of decision to not stream the opening ceremonies. But I'm like, no, 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 not in... BC, BBC, <laughs> uh, that's. I, I have to uh, say, BBC say- has been universally praised for their coverage. Yeah, so they, I mean, we, we have different uh, circumstances from NBC, you know, we don't actually have to make a buck off it, so that makes it easier to um, uh, do more appropriate things with the content, I think. Well, and that was, I think, uh, without you guys doing exceptional streaming, I mean, you had so many, uh, so much content available at any given time, and it was all real time, and it allowed the user to dictate their own experience. Uh, compare that to the the patronizing, hand-holding experience that Americans got from NBC. There was a lot of pent-up rage and frustration, and I think it was made all the more stark by the exceptional coverage that you guys provided. Yeah, and I think also the whole social media thing going on around it. You know, there used to be a time when you could time shift stuff and uh, there weren't really any spoilers. There there are so many spoilers for something like the Olympics, just ambiently, even even if it wasn't for NBC tweeting the results of things themselves. Um, That people have uh, a sense that things have happened. You know, the the, uh, 
the broadcaster doesn't own the timeline anymore. You had 9.5 million global daily uniques to the BBC Sport website. Uh, you had 106 million video requests. Compare that to the 2010 World Cup when you had 38 million. This, this yeah. must have just crushed your servers. How did you, how did you deal with this? Well, we had good help from uh, two content delivery networks. Um, and uh, apparently the fact that the UK is a small country physically uh, was in our favour because we don't have issues with the speed of light, which apparently you guys in the US do. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, had the, we, had the, we had the laws of physics on our side. Do you mean that, in other words, that you just you had to serve to a smaller area? You didn't have to worry about latency and, uh, and sending things? Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, you could, apparently, we're getting quite geeky now, but apparently there are different routes that, is, uh, that uh, data can take in the U.S. where you effectively get uh, race conditions because some of it goes around the long way and some of it goes a short way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because, because it's a big country relative to light, uh, <laughs> apparently, anyway. Allegedly. So, okay, so tell Allegedly. me this. There had to be phenomenal amounts of pressure going into this. Of course, the Olympics, one of the biggest, most important, most watched properties of all. Did you guys, you had to internally make some estimates as to how popular streaming services would be during this. How close were you guys to the mark? Were, were you pretty much on or were you surprised by how many people watched? We were a bit low. Our estimates were slightly low, but not, not too far out. And of course, we prepared for um, more than we got, actually. Um, one of our concerns was that we might break the internet in the UK because uh, we, our capacity planning sort of involves taking, uh, drawing a pie chart of the internet core capacity in the UK and basically saying that we'll have three quarters of it. Uh, wow. That, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's probably not literally like that because it's not, you know, universally, the, the, there are bottlenecks and so on. But uh, yeah, basically we were slightly worried that we might cripple some other services. We were so... Here in the United States, a big story is there are certain cable providers looking to put bandwidth caps in that would limit how much data you're able to pull down from the Internet. Do you guys, is that an issue in the U.K.? And the, did that factor into your plans as far as what quality of streams to offer? Yeah, somewhat. Uh, we get traffic shaping uh, starting to appear in the U.K. where, you know, video traffic might be um, limited uh, over general web traffic, um, which is problematic for us. Um, the adaptive bitrate streaming technology we were using works pretty well in that case. It, do, it does, as long as the sun band looks fair, it, you know, it drops down the quality and you, you still actually get, you can get playback. Um, but yeah, we, we actively talk to the ISPs and try and discourage them from um, throttling our bandwidth, basically. Now, uh, I was unfortunately traveling overseas, so it uh, complicated my ability to watch, especially over the Internet, where uh, I was in Indonesia for most of it when bandwidth was not available. But had I been at home, I might have theoretically experimented with uh, using a VPN to try to experience it as somebody who lives in, in England. Did, was that another factor? Did you worry about people tunneling in, pretending to be British citizens to get the full experience locally? We weren't really worried from a capacity point of view, but we um, uh, our licensing uh, deal for the content doesn't allow us to distribute it outside of the UK. Um, so it would have been possible that NBC and other broadcasters would have um, had a legitimate complaint if they thought that we were making it too easy for, for you know people in the US and elsewhere to view it. So we were slightly braced for any um, difficulty of that sort. What could you do, though? I mean, if, if, I mean, the whole point of VPN is security. It keeps your packets safe. I actually have a VPN service that I use specifically when I'm at a Wi-Fi hotspot that I, I, prevent, I prevent anybody from sniffing my traffic. But, of course, as Brian said, it, it could be used to sort of do an end around of geolocation. Uh, and and I, I get why they want to pretend like regional differences matter uh, still, but... There, it's sort of it's sort of faking it. I mean, if VPN became a bigger problem, and and someone like NBC raised a hand and said, "Hey, we need to stop that," is there is there anything people can do as broadcasters? I mean, it would be kind of a game of whack a mole. I think you know, you, you, we could block um, IP addresses that we identified as belonging to VPN providers, but I imagine that they can shift addresses fairly quickly, and it it, it just feels. It feels like an unwinnable game, you know?
Well, and it's a different on the streaming side of things because, like, uh, when you're talking about downloading, you're downloading illegal content, right? It's like you are taking a copy of this movie that you did not pay for, and now it resides on your hard drive. And it's clear that you are, you know, for lack of a better term, a thief is what we like to say. Uh, but uh, with a stream, it's a little bit different. It's sort of like how how illegal is that where it's just like you you would just kind of shout, like, stop watching that. You're not supposed to be watching that. Stop watching because there is no permanency to it. There's um, an ethereal nature to it that I think makes things all the more twisted and, and more gray for me. I don't know why. Yeah, it, it, intuitively, it doesn't feel like the same kind of thing, does it? But I, I guess legally, it probably is. Um, yeah. I, I am not a lawyer. Uh, yeah, right. We don't mean to put you in a in a in a bad position there. I mean, uh, I know that the BBC puts up a notice that says you must be a license holder. You must have paid your license fee in order to watch this video. Not not for overseas people, for people in the UK who think, aha, I'm not going to pay my television license fee. I'm just going to watch it uh, on the laptop. You, you still have to pay that fee to watch it on the Internet, right? That's right. Yeah. And that notice is there really just as a reminder that, that you have to do that. Um, yeah, that's, you know, we, we work for the British public. We're, we're paid for by the British public. Um, and I guess there's this idea that, uh, that they should get what they paid for. <laughs> now, I, yeah. I know folks at, at home in the UK could press the red button on their televisions and get the 24 live channels, same, same as they could online. Was it the same back end feeding that or was that a different yeah. system? Yeah, that's right. We got 24 uh, feeds from um, the Olympic Broadcast Service. Um, and then we uh, encoded those and used them for all the different purposes that we put them to. We, we used them for Red Button. We also shipped them out to Sky, who um, provided the 24 channels to their digital subscribers. Now, at uh, that level... What, one of the things that in America, you know, NBC, of course, you know, famously mishandled the, the the tape delay of the opening ceremony saying, well, you need our commentators to give a context for what's going on. Of those 24 channels in, you know, broadcast by the BBC, how many of them had commentators doing handholding? How many of them were just raw feeds where people could watch the drama happen real time? And it's up to you to figure out what stuff means. Pretty much all the sporting events had commentary on them. Um there were some streams that occasionally just had sort of ambient stuff on them that, that, that there wasn't any commentator for. But I believe we had uh, a commentator for all the actual disciplines, all the events. I think it's just incredibly impressive to look at the numbers and see how many people uh, use this. People also were using this on tablets and mobile uh, yes. And in fact, in different ways. What, what were some of the things you discovered <laughs> in, in how people were consuming the video mobile versus home? I think it was the first event where we really noticed that the the desktop player, you know, the, the browser-based player, wasn't the main focus anymore. We, you know, we started with um, a Flash-based player that, uh, that people know as iPlayer. And we've always thought of that as our player. And actually, it turns out, if you look at the numbers, that uh, the mobile experience is really uh, as big as that now and, and wow. bound, to, bound to grow faster. How long are you stuck with Flash on the iPlayer then? Because you're not using Flash on the mobile devices. That's right. Well, we need Flash really for... Uh, HLS only works on Apple browsers, and we like to do uh, adaptive bitrate streaming. So that would be, in practice, HLS or HDS. Um, so we use HDS um, for anything that isn't an iOS device, basically. Uh, and that requires Flash. And so, and so how long do you think it'll be before you can move off of that? I mean, eventually Flash is, is not going to be a standard. It may be a wow, but... Um, I have no idea, to be honest. I mean, we're, no we're plans, interested. huh? No, we, we have to be fairly tactical about it. You know, there was, we had a bit of a problem with um, Flash uh, being withdrawn um, from Android. Uh, and originally, I think the Ice Cream Sandwich update was going to kill Flash um, on the phones. <clears throat> which I think, um, I think I'm not being indiscreet, that, that was going to be quite a, <clears throat> embarrassing for Samsung. They were planning to give out phones in the press kit at oh. the Olympics. And we pointed out to them that, uh, that, that iPlayer wouldn't have actually worked on them because they, would have, you know, they wouldn't have had Flash on it. So we, wow. have, to move we have to move fairly quickly. I, I don't think we really make um, even medium-term plans about platforms because they, they still change rapidly enough that we need to be able to to jump quickly, you know. 
So I, I don't think we ran across a single story of a major outage when it came to the streaming services being available. Were there any behind-the-scenes drama? Were there any close calls that uh, they had you? I mean, I'm sure it's got to be two weeks of nothing but white knuckles for you guys. We don't mean for you to tell tales, but if, if there's something you could share with us. So in a sense, yes. In a sense, I'm glad uh, that that was the case. I, I was thinking it's like, imagine some dudes have just built some huge gargantuan machine and they fire it up for the first time. <laughs> if it just if it just runs without any attention, you're sort of a bit worried. You know, what's it actually doing? So you kind of run around in the oil can and, and you know peer inside it and stuff and check that it's doing what you expect. So yeah, there was there was there was a certain amount of hands-on attention. You know, there were things that that stalled processes that were supposed to be automatic that we ended up um, dealing with by hand. We were having to clean up some metadata that we hadn't expected to. It, it was yeah, it was it was pretty dramatic. It was the first time I've had a job with something that was described as a war room, and I was very excited about that. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty fantastic, great. That's fantastic, man. Well, congratulations on the fantastic coverage, and congratulations on the the universally positive response that's it's been going. This is one of the greatest stories in live content streaming, uh, and uh, you know, this is the beginning of what we here at Framerate think is a real sea change on the way people not only consume their media, but expect to be able to consume their media. Well, on behalf of all the people at the BBC who worked on it, of, of whom there are hundreds, um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, we're glad it worked. All right. Well, and good luck uh, uh, two years hence. Uh, I imagine you'll be, you'll be doing it all over again in Sochi, right? Yes, so, yes. Huh. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, are you going to hang around with us for the rest of the show then? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Yes. Uh, awesome. Dude, fantastic. Well, let's dive into another big story then. I didn't read the show notes yet, so I have no idea what we're talking about. I'll just say random stuff, okay? Yeah, we don't know either. Stop everything. It's another big story. It's a, It's kind of a time for live events to be consumed on the Internet. More than 3.2 million people watched the descent of the Mars Curiosity rover on Ustream, a CNET article from Derek Kerr points out that that's actually more than CNN, MSNBC, and Fox combined. 3.2 million people total, not all at one time, but 3.2 right. million people total. CNN had 426,000, MSNBC had 365,000, and Fox came in the highest, but still only 803,000. Uh, this is exceptional, and and again, I know I know you don't like it when I point out our own coverage here at, at you know on on other stuff, but you guys at Twit did a fantastic job covering this thing. It was, I don't mind you pointing it out. It's you know I don't want to appear self congratulatory, but exactly. we did cover it, and it was fun, and it was great having you on, and we had a lot of people watch it. Absolutely, absolutely, and and keep in mind, you know, this is our our this is us carving out a very small piece of a very large pie. Number one, this is exciting because so many people are so interested in space exploration, which is always good. Number two, everybody, uh, NASA provided their own feed, much like you know, of course, uh, BBC made available all these feeds, uh, and people could decide their own experience. Did they want? commentators to contextualize what they were seeing did they want to watch it on television or did they want to just like shut up i just want to watch these scientists at uh i assume the jet propulsion laboratories or wherever where did the feed come from i assumed it was the jpl yeah it was it was from uh, ames same research center the jpl folks there in the control room uh i i feel like there's a separation here that's very interesting. When I talk to people about the Mars Curiosity rover, the people who generally watch television sort of were aware of it. They heard about it. There were stories about it. Those stories were mixed in with other stories, and it seemed like an interesting side bit to them. To the people who watched it on Ustream or watched the NASA feed or watched our Twit feed, they felt like it was the biggest event humanity has experienced in recent <laughs> history. Maybe not ever, Certainly, but but definitely a gargantuan event, and I think it made a, a lot of a, a lot of difference in your awareness of it. Andy, did you did you watch this? Were you aware of what was going on with Curiosity, or did, were you your head down in the trench with the no, Olympics? I, I had other stuff going on. I, I was just wondering though, did they? Do you know if they had a data feed that went along with that? Was it a kind of metadata enhanced experience, or was it just the video? They had they had some feeds, and I can't remember exactly what you could access on NASA because I was I was busy with our stuff here, so, same as you. I had my head down in a in a different trench, uh, but there there was uh, a lot. There was a set. There were like four different feeds I think you could get from NASA that were showing you different information, different scenes. Right, I'm thinking that there would have been some fascinating telemetry information that could have been 
use to enhance the video. I, I'm speculating, of course, because I didn't see it. But one, one of the things that was interesting about the Olympics was how much value the data added. Uh, being able to dig into the backstory about athletes and things like that. Uh, I hadn't anticipated how valuable that would be. And I'm thinking if I'm watching something landing on Mars, there's an awful lot of data that I could uh, get interested in along with the pictures. Yeah, you were definitely able to see the minutes to the next stage. You were able to see distance, kilometers until till landing, all of that sort of thing. Well, I would right. imagine if you had the right kind of equipment, I mean, they're, they're probably not encoding the signal back from Mars. If you had the right kind of equipment, you should be able to grab uh, one of the relays and actually grab that stuff raw. And I'm sure there are enthusiasts out there who do that kind of thing, kind of hijack NASA signals. You have to have a very big satellite dish to do that <laughs> seriously like it because uh, there, there's a lot of talk today about could someone hack into the firmware update that that went on with curiosity <laughs> holy cow and, that's and, something that could happen well, wow. and the thing is could i hack into the firmware update outside of nasa uh, yes if i had a lot of money uh because i'd have to build a very large disk and use a lot of electricity to get a powerful enough signal to send but the you know, side note is it a, gets a lot easier if I social engineer my way into NASA and hack into one of their computers because then I use their dish. Could you imagine, though, what like a geek heist movie about exactly that, about uh, <laughs> pirating, about taking over? And what if it wasn't just to hold it hostage and get money? Or maybe that's a cover for it and there's something they actually want to accomplish. I don't know. There's a movie in here. This is a great idea. Yeah. And obviously, uh, receiving the signal is not as hard as transmitting to it. But you still you still need some pretty big equipment because it's a, it's a fairly faint signal that, that they're getting. Sure. But, I, I again, two big stories here that I think uh, really point the way – towards what we're going to see four, eight, it's, ten years from now is, is people watching things where they want to watch it without thinking about been, the Internet. It has been an exceptional couple of weeks for live streaming, and I think live streaming has always kind of been the red-headed stepchild. You know, the numbers that you see on live streaming so often are, are pale in comparison to what, you know, a, 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 you know, a cat on a surfboard will do on YouTube. So you, YouTube, these short videos that are in recorded edited format will oftentimes explode and they get numbers that rival traditional television but very very rarely do we see that with streaming and to have two big stories like this that are absolutely exceptional on people going straight to the source i think is it's good news for the for the changing face of the way people consume their media we got yet another big story it's a very quick one though if we can just pile keep dancing go dancing girl. Tucking your bootstraps, it's yet another big story. Uh, just a quick plug here. The International Academy of Web Television, uh, which I'm a member of, is has opened their submissions for awards. So if you're a video maker, if you've got a show uh, and you would like to submit it for consideration, go to submissions.iwtv.org. There is a submission fee. Uh, so some people, this may not be the right thing for them. And I know some people are critical of the fact that they charge a fee. The fee does go to run the awards to run the voting and to do the awards ceremony and that sort of thing and it does keep the number of submissions down uh huh. and we could have we can have an argument about whether that's appropriate or not but that is the way they do it huh so you're saying you're a member of this uh, academy of web television huh? yes and you could so you could submit shows that for consideration for awards huh well yeah anybody can submit shows you just go to submissions.iwtv.org why, why why do you ask brian well, I'm just, I'm just saying there's a show I do with this guy that, uh, I mean, it just seems like seems like we're sort of on the cutting edge of news about streaming and the changing face of new media. Occasionally we have fantastic guests. This one time we had this guy from the other side of the world who, you know, did live streaming for this really big event. I don't know if you saw it. Just seems like, I mean, they should at least consider it for an award. Huh. huh. Uh, yeah, well, send me the information. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we, no, I, I'll right. help you out with that. Definitely. Uh, no, not, not a problem. <laughs> Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor for today's show, the new Squarespace.com, the faster and easier way to create a high-quality website or blog. Squarespace, everybody's launching new stuff. We got a new rover on Mars. We just had a brand new Olympics, and now there's a new Squarespace content management system that is freaking amazing, Brian. I have not touched it yet. And I to be honest, like I actually I fired over just before they released the new Squarespace 6. I I said to over I was like, "Hey man, can you can we talk about, you know, refreshing my page? I love my page, but nowadays I'm doing more live streaming stuff and it's still really centered on my stage show. Can we talk about refreshing?" And they're like, "Hold on until we release 
some new hotness and you're going to love it. So my guess is sometime in the next month, I'm going to dive in deep and just completely blow up Shwood.com and make it a totally different thing. HTML5, CSS3, brand new JavaScript foundations, retranslates your website into multiple formats. So every image gets, gets reformatted into seven different sizes so it looks right on whatever screen you're looking at your website on. Uh, and, and that's just part of the service. 100% drag and drop functionality for your customization tools and all of the things you used to love about Squarespace. All of the social media buttons, things like Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff is there. You can still import your blog. Uh, they still have data portability. You can take your site with you when you go. It's a unified service that makes it faster and easier than ever to create a high quality website or blog. And because you're listening to this show, you're going to save some money. Now, you, you don't even have to be listening to this show. You can go try out Squarespace without giving them a credit card. You don't have to risk anything to try it out. So go do that. And if you like it, use the offer code FRAMERATE8 and you'll get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. That's 10% off the monthly account for the first month. Or if you buy a year at once, you get 10% off the entire year. And don't forget, free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. That's Squarespace.com. Use that offer code FRAMERATE8. And we thank them for their support of FRAMERATE. Let's get into the slipstream. Slipstream is all about the services that allow you to watch the stuff that you want to watch, where you want to watch it. Uh, and let's start with an unusual service. It's not Netflix or Hulu. It's archive.org. The Internet Archive now offering over one million torrents, including live music concerts, the Prelinger movie collection, audiobook collections, old-time radio, tons of books, and they're, they're soliciting people to upload even more. They say they're just going to automatically add torrent links to everything. Everybody who says, oh, well, you talk about torrents, the legal uses of torrent. What's a legal use of a torrent? Well, here's one, movies. Right. Well, uh, in fact, when I read the headline, the headline just said over one million torrents of downloadable books, music, and movies. And I'm like, really? That's that's a st- We just now low. hit a- yeah, that can't be, uh, seems like there'd be more. But then realizing that this is all just from archive, archive.org and the work they do over at archive.org is phenomenal. I think that the uh, the content they have available is shockingly good. Uh, I, obviously, that's how I saw all of a boy and his dog. And uh, think about as we move into a remix culture, uh, as we speak in images that meant something in the past, uh, archive.org is going to be a increasingly more important uh, repository of essentially different instruments. If, if you want to say something, you could say more by flashing a three-second clip of a particular movie that uh, that means something to everyone than you can in, you know, entire paragraphs. And uh, I, that's what I love about making all of this available to everyone everywhere. And the distributive hosting of BitTorrent, of course, is uh, is awesome. Plus, it's great to see BitTorrent, anything that legitimizes BitTorrent as a distribution platform, I'm happy to see. Andy, what hey do you guys, guys think of this? I, I'm thinking somebody should do a netcast that curates archive.org because the problem is basically knowing where to start. I mean, I love archive.org. Um, but this you kind is of a need to, idea. You kind of need to know what you're looking for, right? So if somebody was to do a regular netcast that just pulled in interesting curiosities out of the archive, I think that would be a great thing. I think that's a fantastic idea. I mean, you can go right now to the most downloaded items section, and that, that's a nice filter uh, to see, like, what, what are people grabbing out of there? What are people finding? So Night of the Living Dead is in there. Dress to Kill is in there. They've got some staff picks in there. Jason Mraz live at Java Joe's. I think that's in San Francisco, actually. Uh, so so there, there's a few ways to kind of, you know, cut through the, the chaff. But a, a kind of a regular recommendation show would be kind of cool. Especially if whoever hosted the show could provide a context and explain why this is extraordinary and maybe even tell the stories, you know, stuff like, um, you know, when Night of the Living Dead, it, it's copyright expired basically because someone forgot to, if I remember correctly, basically forgot to file paperwork appropriately. And so all of a sudden this movie that wasn't very old at all was suddenly available to everyone on there. And I think there's some fascinating stories of why these things end up in uh, the public domain. I think this, this, is a, this is a hell of an idea for a show. So are you gonna are you gonna do it, Brian? Uh, you know what? I'm immediately gonna pretend that I invented that idea. So if you don't mind, Chad, we're just gonna edit out the last five minutes. That'd be great. Have, have that one on me. <laughs> Excellent. 
Uh, there's a new website competing with Aereo. We've been following the Aereo uh, lawsuit here. Aereo, if you don't know, is a, a service in New York that will stream local television channels that are br- free to broadcast over the air to you for a small fee. So if you, if you don't get over-the-air broadcast very well in the place that you live in New York City, you can get this service. And they're saying, look, all we're doing is providing a long extension cord to an antenna. They're in court with the major networks over this idea. Well, now there's another site called Barry Driller. Dot com. Now, Barry Diller is the executive who's backing Aereo. He's a very famous television executive, started Fox. Uh, BarryDriller.com is poking fun at him. They're allowing for, for less than Aereo, $6 a month, you to get streams of New York channels as well as KTTVDT, uh, the digital tier channel in L.A. But, well, and but that's the, the biggest it, problem right there is that they're streaming a channel out of market. Right. They're doing it totally illegally, which I don't understand. I'm not really following the point of this entire thing. Is their goal, if their goal is to call out Aereo for being wrong, then why are they doing it in a way that's even more wrong than Aereo would be if they believe Aereo is wrong? But they are, they're me- saying we're going to actually license, we'll, we'll, we'll pay retransmission fees, whereas Aereo is saying we don't need to pay retransmission fees. It's Alki David. Uh, he's, he's kind of a, of a pot stirrer. In, in the streaming world, he's done a, a he's done film on, uh, which has has been a website that that has restreamed television streams from all over the world without permission. Uh, and he's tried to claim that he was able to get through on a technicality. He's the one who accused CBS of aiding and abetting copyright oh, oh, infringement uh, for uh, for allowing things in download.com. And this is his latest gambit is to go after Barry Diller, and get some attention. Well, I mean, are we doing a disservice by even reporting this? If all he wants to do is stir the pot, look, the pot, the pot is boiling over right now. I don't know that we need more people doing crazy crap to there get it. There are atten- people in the chat room before the show. I mean, I already had it in here, and I because I knew this, but there are people in the chat room saying, "Hey, can you explain this Barry Driller thing? What's going on with it? What's going on with it is it's a publicity stunt for Alki David, uh, and and that's fine, and he's trying to." kind of slice the law in a different way, saying, I'll pay retransmission fees, which Aereo won't, but I want to be able to broadcast television channels out of market. So if you're in New York, I want to be able to show you the L.A. channel. And and the networks definitely do not want that, or the local channels don't, definitely do not want that. Uh, uh, all right. We'll, we'll see how that turns out for everything. I mean, uh, I guess good job on spinning us around in more circles. Right. Amazon is adding device-specific parental controls to instant video. Does this, uh, does this, as a parent, does this uh, appe- yeah, please as, you? I'll tell you what. I, I'm going to squeeze in an extra story here. A bunch of people sent me. I mentioned before how I wish that the Netflix for Kids was available on the Xbox. They have since added that. I haven't, I haven't touched it because, again, I've been out of town. I just got back a couple hours ago. But I can't wait to enable that and let the kids go nuts on the Xbox, exploring anything, and me knowing that they're safe because it's all kid crap. Uh, and uh, by the way, kid crap, that's a trademark of Brian Brushwood. Uh, and uh, it, the more of these tools that people decide to make available on their own without any kind of bureaucracy declaring, decreeing that it needs to happen, the better. And I think that many of these businesses are getting savvy earlier. And to be honest, now I'm looking at YouTube and it is shocked. Why does YouTube not have any kind of self uh you, it seems like at the very least you should be able to make a, a rating of your own of for content that you submit and you should be able to set your account to only see certain kinds of things google needs to get on the train any does any of this stuff uh interest you is this something you have to deal with do you have kids yeah sure i mean the whole business of um how to give people as much control as they need over the availability of content and the playback experience is is very interesting to us. We don't have so much stuff that um, you'd be very worried about kids seeing, I guess. Um, But, yeah, uh, giving adequate parental control. I'm just thinking, actually, as you were talking, I realise I don't know whether we do it um, Amazon style at the moment or not. So I'm not very very well briefed to talk about that. But, uh, yeah, we do have a parental lock on uh, on the iPlayer apps. Uh, which I think is per device. So, but I could be wrong. Back in 2010, YouTube did add parental controls. Have you have you been made, have you tried those, Brian? Are they just not very good? Uh, no. What I do is I just run my mouth off about saying things that I would like to have be there, and I don't really check. Uh, I just <laughs> nobody's done anything. Well, and I've heard the, to, to your credit, I've heard other people say YouTube needs better parental controls. So they just they may be rather ham fisted. I don't know. Yeah. 
I, I believe it. But I'll tell you this much. I've been in the room, and the kid uh, starts off watching, you know, uh, bootleg crappy copies of the Spider-Man 1960s series. And then before I know it, I'm hearing all kinds of colorful four-letter words. Well, you and- might want to look into it because I know for sure that YouTube allows you to block videos that have been deemed unsafe for teens. But I don't know how well it works. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I know that there are certain things that are flagged. You have to be logged in in order to see them. But uh, uh, whatever it is, they certainly aren't pushing it clear enough that, that disinterested parents can know without looking. AOL HD app uh, launched on Boxy, Roku, and Yahoo Connected TV previously. They've now changed the name to AOL On, and they're rolling it out to more platforms. Samsung Smart TV, Roku, and Sony platforms with TiVo Premier DVR access due in a few weeks after a beta test ends. Uh, This has a lot of different content from a lot of different places. Some of it broadcast uh, things like uh, the BBC, for instance, is actually available through AOL on. Uh, some of the content is. Also Reuters, AP, CNET, uh, and the Engadget Show. All the AOL properties obviously are there. I wonder if that Huffington Post Live channel that just launched today is going to be in there. Did you get a chance to look at that? They've, they've got sort of a, a live news channel going on from the Huffington Post now. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that should be part of this as well. Yeah, I have not. But then again, I don't. I don't have a Roku uh, or a Samsung. Oh, I see it on the screenshot. HPSN Live. So yeah, go go. You can. You don't have to have a Roku to go check out Huffington Post Live, though. They're just they're just streaming, uh, and and it's it's the kind of con. It's, it's basically what Twit is to tech. Huffington Post Live is to the kinds of things you read on the Huffington Post. They're just yeah talking course, about those course. kinds of topics. Let's move on to tube tops. <laughs> Just a couple of things here. Not a lot of uh, set-top box news this week, but uh, Sling Player hinting that they might be coming to game consoles. Uh, So what that would mean is if you had a Sling Box connected to your TV, there would be a player app on the game console that then would allow you to, to view the Sling play box connected television on the game console. Now, you, if you only have one major TV and your Xbox and your Sling box are sitting right next to each other, this isn't going to help you much. Uh, yes. But if you've got the game box, if you've got the Xbox like down in a basement uh, and, and you want to watch something that's on the DVR upstairs, you don't have whole home DVR or something like that, it could, it could come in handy that way. I mean, how many people do you think? I mean, I think it's great that they're trying to give a complete solution. I think it's great that they're trying to think of every possible way to make it available for people to watch their own content. But I mean, how many people do you think this applies to? I could think well, of that's maybe. A, that, that's exactly the story. Sling. The re- reason we know they're considering it is Sling is doing a survey saying, hey, if we rolled out a Sling player app on the Xbox, would that excite you? I mean, the answer for me is I can't imagine why I'd want to use it. But uh, But then again, you know, I'm not a sling player nut i'm i'm crazy about the idea of it but i haven't used it like just robert young is crazy for uh for his sling player he watches it all the time do you, do you ever use a sling player andy yeah well I, I i was just gonna say isn't it crazy the number of devices that uh, the proliferation of devices that will stream video from in various ways into your tv uh do, do you guys ever forget which device does what you know no, like I- whether you have to Tom doesn't though. Tom's a freaking. Uh, he's like uh, he's like Rain Man. He can't forget anything yeah, Tom, about players. Tom, Tom looks like a pretty organized dude to me. But you know, <laughs> I guess we're I guess we're fairly chaotic, eh, Brian? But seriously, yes. uh, you know, as you, as you were talking about, uh, you know, the, it's on this platform, but it's not on that pl- platform yet. Obviously, that's a major headache that we have. Um, but really, it seems like well, there must, at some point in the near future, be some convergence. Um, I, I, th- I think, you know, I can play video on uh, an Xbox, an Apple TV, I've got a Boxy, uh, my TV can do stuff. And quite often I can't remember where the movie I want to watch is or which device has the best capability for playing it. You know, and it, it's, from, from a consumer point of view, it's fairly crazy. And of course, from the point of view of um, AOL or the BBC or whoever is su- actually supporting the devices is a bit of a nightmare as well. I actually am not nearly as organized as I look, and I definitely have run into that that position where I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to, oh, right, I can't do that on this. Like, or yeah. I get frustrated, like, where is, oh, no, it's not on this device. It's on the other thing. It's it's so much well, fragmentation. It's, it's even tough to remember, like, uh, I was going to say, it's even tough to remember, like, well, is it physically on this, or did I stream I remember seeing this movie on my iPad. but Exactly, was it- yes. Bad. 
Yeah. I, you know, uh, we, uh, we also have one more story before we, uh, we get out of uh, the tube tops. XBMC, the Xbox Media Center is what it used to stand for. It's now really just a, a really good open source media manager. It's coming to the Ouya game console, that $99 yes. Android-based game console. How much do you think of Ouya's success is essentially what people accused uh, Barack Obama's campaign of being, which is essentially being this blank canvas onto which you could project all the things you wish a set-top box could do, and Ouya will be like, hey, bro, open source, Android. It, it, sure, it'll, yes, it's all those things. Like, I, I think it's great. Well, it's not projecting when you have the app, Brian. Yeah, well, yes, 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 yes. But that, that's. I, I pretend like Ouya can do it. No, it can do XBMC. They have the software. It will run. Well, exactly. But the reason this is exciting is because now my brain is racing and thinking about all the other things I wanted guys, to do. As well. guys, that's the reason. Guys, that's, that's the question. Guys, that's overpriced. It'll run on Raspberry Pi as well. <laughs> well, seriously, that, that's like thirty-five dollars, isn't it? $25 yeah, no, you're right. No, that's a it's a really good point. I mean, I mean, it's not hard, but it is one of those things where it it people are like, oh, good, that got ported too. That I'm going to do online. I'm going to do XBMC. It's only ninety nine dollars. Uh, are you yes. saying we're going to be disappointed in four years by Ouya? I'm just going to say that Ouya is probably going to double down on the policies of Xbox. We're not going to extract ourselves from the war of Call of Duty, Black Ops 2. Um, I think we're still going to be paying taxes and Microsoft points. Will and- I be looking at the modern Wigs console <laughs> yeah. as a possible option? Uh, well, I'll tell you what you need to look at is, is the Tory. The Tory coming out is going to be phenomenal. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Film Film. <laughs> I'm reporting this story because I just found out about this series. Uh, Adam Whitehead over at the Word Zone uh, says that there is a third gamers movie being made from the Dead Gentleman Productions folks. I didn't know they'd made the first two. And I guess they've been waiting for a third movie for about five years. And they've decided to go to Kickstarter to make the third one. But Gamers is a series of low-budget gamer movies that are about... Role-playing games. Uh, it was The Gamers, Hands of Fate uh, is the new one. It'll pick up several years after the events of Darkness Rising. Same cast of characters. Uh, and he describes the first two Gamers films as probably the best and most accurate representations of role-playing put to film. So these are, uh, they, they what, they take role-playing games, they act them out, or they depict people playing role-playing games? Or I, I read it all and I wasn't really clear on what it was, but it sounds like you're excited about it. I am excited that the, I, I believe what it is, is they, yes, they take, they do what the Dungeons and Dragons movies tried to do, which is take a role playing scenario and make a movie out of it. Um, Got it. But this is much more, for people who actually play role playing games, this is going to have a lot of nods and winks and like, this is what role playing games are actually like because it's made by people who actually play role playing games. Uh, so it'll hit those beats and uh, uh, roughly follow the exact kind of real-life scenarios you end up with. I, I say real life in playing a game. Yeah, right. Uh, scenarios that you end up with. How about this? Will this excite you, Brian? Arrested Development started filming. It's in production. Uh, the entire cast is about ready to sign on, and this will be on Netflix. They're going to do all the episodes at once, just like they did uh, with Lilyhammer uh, in 2013. Uh, yes, I'm totally excited. But can we talk about this? We have not. We've sort of touched briefly on their decision to make stuff available all at once, and it's a very Netflix thing to do. I'm going to say I'm going to be really disappointed if they do that on uh, Arrested Development because it means there'll be one exciting week when all the episodes come out, and that'll be the end of it. And it's like I don't want that. It's right. like I no, I know did. you have no self control, and that's Netflix's responsibility. No, this is if Netflix, Netflix spent all this money because this is a marketing decision. They want to be seen as a network and it, it, they could blow that whole. It's like it's like I gave you a Christmas present and you're like, yeah, but you know what? I'm really going to play with this a lot and I'm really going to enjoy it. And then I'm going to be depressed afterwards. Arrested Development is in production. Can't you just be happy about that? I am thrilled. And in fact, I, I, I'm already in my mind, I'm humming the final countdown. It's, 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 it's amazing and exciting and wonderful. Uh, I just wish they got more for their money by spending, by releasing it over time so people would talk about it longer. And Andy, are you a fan of Arrested Development? Do you know the show? I don't know what Arrested Development is. I'm oh, afraid. well, we have a treat okay, well, for you. Arrested Development, let me ask, uh, do, are you familiar with the increasingly poor decisions of Todd, Todd Margaret? 
Because I know that was on in... in... <laughs> no, I'm a cultural right. idiot. Okay. It's a fantastic show. Yeah, All definitely. of them are amazing shows. I, I, I was thinking the thing about uh, box sets and uh, whole, whole seasons that come out at once. I, I like to watch them like that. You know, I like to watch them back to back. I had a, a lost week watching series one to four of Battlestar Galactica once, and it was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> But, you know, hard work, really, really hard work. It's kind of, do I have to watch another DVD today? Oh, I guess uh, I do. Well, all right. (laughs) Nose to the grindstone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Peter Jackson will release The Hobbit in 48 frames per second, despite all the controversy of how it looks or how it doesn't look. Uh, And Warner Brothers is going to release it in a limited fashion, though. Only certain theaters uh, that will be upgraded uh, by the end of the year when it comes out, December is when, it, when it's coming out, will have the ability to show it in 48 frames per second. So they're going to have to spend some money to downgrade it to 24 frames per second for the rest of the theaters out there. But they just are, I think they're a little nervous about putting it out there with the reception that it's gotten at the two screenings. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, from their perspective, like when I think about it from a consumer perspective, this makes me sad because this is a significant advancement that would provide a fundamentally different, altered experience in watching the movie. Now, keep in mind, I've never seen anything at true 48 frames per second outside of a video game. The most I've seen has been the frame interpolation that you get on some of the Samsung televisions, and it looks terrible. It makes really good movies look or or at least feel like cheesy, poorly produced productions. So I understand why there's been the feedback that that makes them cautious. But their question suddenly becomes, some people say, no, you're going to like it eventually when you watch the whole movie. And maybe that's true, maybe that's not. But regardless, now it's a situation where it's like, do we want to go to bat for a new viewing platform? Do we want to sell people not just that they should watch The Hobbit, but that everyone should be excited on 48 frames per second? Uh, and that's going to be a tough sell for them to want to throw well, that Well, I kind think of- there's a smarter way of selling it, Brian. I mean, what they're saying is instead of forcing every theater in it and having a huge backlash because there are people who aren't ready to for it or it looks different and they just don't like it, they're saying, let's do a test. Let's show Perfect. it in certain places where people who really want to watch it in 48 frames per second will go... And then we can see what they think and see what the experience is like. And also remember, the tests that they showed previously were not final production film. Uh, So they weren't fully processed. They didn't have all the effects. They didn't have all the shading done. Uh, So some of the reactions may just be the fact that you're watching raw footage in some cases rather than the final produced footage. Well, and keep in mind also, this also opens up the possibility of this puts the the studio in the perfect position because if all of a sudden, if nobody likes it, they're like, well, it's a good thing we only did limited release. If everybody loves it, then they five, ten years later are able to re-release it so that everybody gets the chance to see the 48 frames per second. Well, everybody has a chance. You just have to drive a little farther to find the theater probably. That's all. Yeah. It's not like they're not re- they're only releasing it in one place. It's just going to be yes. in limited release. releasing it only in one living room, and in it'll be free Hobbiton. Free. In the, yes, it's, exactly. Yeah. You'll Given to, that most people won't see both versions, uh, very few people are actually going to know whether it's better or not, are they? Yeah, right. Because if you go, if you go see the forty-eight, you're going to say, "Well, that was fantastic," but you know. And then you see the record. saw it in 24, and they said, yeah, man, it was fantastic. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> my fantastic is better than your fantastic. It's actually twice as fantastic. Fantastic yes. per second was 48. Exactly. <laughs> I, I suspect it is like HD in the sense that it's a bit of a one-way street. You know, to start with, you think you don't need it. But uh, once you get used to watching HD, it's very hard to go back. All right, I'm not sure if this is good news, bad news, good news, good news. Uh, Part of it's definitely good news. Joss Whedon is officially signed on to write and direct the Avengers sequel. And just on the heels of that news, we got the news that Ben Affleck has been approached by Warner Brothers to direct the Justice League movie. All right, now hold on. It's easy to dig on Ben Affleck because he's pretty, but his movie, uh, was it Gone Baby Gone, the first movie that he directed, was uh, pretty much universally uh, appreciated. People thought it was good. He's not a bad director, but the question here is whether or not he deserves to take the helm of a massive franchise without essentially paying very many dues uh, because he doesn't have a lot of films underneath his belt. Well, as and, a, and these announcements coming right on the heels of each other. The reason people say that the Avengers was so successful is that Joss Whedon was a huge fan of the Avengers. He was steeped in the Avengers and it showed in that kind of depth of feeling and emotion in the writing and he knew how to handle the characters and make them play off each other. 
And I don't know, is Ben Affleck deeply well, involved in the Justice League in the same way? Maybe he is, but I've never heard so. But I'll tell you, on top of that, Joss Whedon has experience writing for comic books. He's the one, you know, he wrote one of the best uh, uh, arcs in the entire X-Men stories. And, uh, you know, he has a, a lot more experience directing and writing than than Ben Affleck does. Now, that's not to say that Ben can't pull it off. And certainly Ben, uh, I, from everything I've heard, he is a real geek and does dig comic books. But But does it matter how much he loves it? What matters is how good he can produce. All right. Uh, let's uh, finish up with the Deadline Weekly YouTube rankings. Uh, the London Summer Olympics in full swing during this period, which ended Friday, August 10th. And uh, Team USA is a YouTube-funded channel, and of the YouTube-funded channels, it gained 3.1 million views for a total of nearly 4 million in the week, leaping 20 shots to, slots to number 6. Uh, one interesting thing, we've been talking about how Time Warner Sound, the Warner Sound, because it's music, has been on top of this channel chart the whole time we've been watching it, uh, it actually uh, saw the biggest drop in views next to SourceFed. Huh. Uh, by the way, I'm just now getting that open. When I clicked on the link, it started to play an ad, so I had to mute. I don't hear. If you were insulting me just for a second there, Tom, I didn't oh, I hear. I missed my ch I mean, no, I, was, I wasn't. I, said, <laughs> I was praising you, Brushwood. I was saying what a great co-host you Wasn't are. I, Andy? Wasn't I just saying? Yes, no. absolutely. Yes, it, it was a bit... Uh, it was a bit grovelly, actually. <laughs> so uh, the WWE Fan Nation, have we seen that in the top ten before this yeah. week? No, it's been it's been up there. It, it didn't okay. move. I mean, it, it had a nice big jump, uh, or actually had a little bit of a fall. Uh, prior week ranking was number three, and it fell okay. to number four. Man, I don't know how I missed that. That's crazy. Well, it's right there. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's because I'm not very bright, Tom. That's the real reason. Thank you. <laughs> You're the point. brightest star in the whole Thousands galaxy. of people just heard that, That's Brian. That's not what you said when he was muted. No, but it was, it was more poetic than that. You're right. Uh, let's check in on the remains of the summer movie draft. Must we? I guess we must. Well, Born Legacy did better for Veronica Belmont than Total Recall did for me. Total Recall's ended up being a total flop. Veronica got $38 million out of the Born Legacy uh, in the first weekend. That's not too bad. The campaign, $26 million, probably about as expected. Uh, so going into the final weekend, we have Veronica Belmont with Sparkle, which I still think is going to outperform. Uh, we're going to have Sarah Lane with The Expendables 2 and myself with Paranorman. But none of us can even no. touch Justin Robert Young with his 900, almost $1 billion at it the top of the chart. It is the biggest, uh, as Justin was quick to repeatedly point out to me as we were hanging out this week, it is the largest total of any movie draft in the history of this, of this franchise. Uh, I'll, I will say this, the biggest surprise to me, if you had told me after the draft, that I would do better than Sarah, because I was convinced I was going to be dead last. Maybe Veronica might be behind me, but I was convinced I'd be dead last. But if you told me that I was on track to beat Sarah Lane, given that she had Dark Knight Rises and all those other movies, she held on to all that money, and she got all those last-minute hits, and, it, they, you know, they didn't pan out. That's It's amazing to me that uh, she's only at $450 million and I'm sitting at 615 It's crazy. All right, so uh, most of what I watched this past week was the Olympics. We've already talked about that. I know you watched the 30 and 30 documentary, but we want to save time for the Breaking Bad uh, spoiler zone at the end of the show. Should we go right to feedback? Uh, yeah, let me just real quick say that uh, on Netflix, uh, ESPN's 30 and 30, it's 30 stories from 30 documentaries in 30 years. They're way, way good. I watch two of them, and I hate sports. I'm not just ambivalent about sports. I'm just like, ah, great, people throwing balls in ways I don't care. But it's like they do a fantastic job, and specifically, there's one documentary called Silly Little Game that is about the founding, the people who created fantasy baseball, and it bears a shocking resemblance to to what is happening right now with uh, the NSFW frame rate movie drafts that we're doing. All right, let's move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on frame rate. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quickly, Hate Bad Design wrote in and said, hey, remember the musician Gatti had a huge hit with somebody that I used to know? As usually happens, tons of fans have been posting their cover versions or remixes to YouTube. However, rather unusually, Gatti himself has now taken a slew of fan-made cover versions and remixed them into the ultimate remix cover version of his own song. We got the link there uh, from Hate Bad Design. You can take a look at that. We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but really cool idea to actually like take 
all of the remixes of your song and remix them, the, all the covers and remixes, and put them together. This is amazing. Can we can we get a listen to yeah, this? Yeah, I thought can Chad you... was just going to start playing it while we were talking. Sorry. Let's get started. Just click right in the middle there. You can see, like, he's got several different frames in several different places uh, in there. And these are all different people who did their own versions that he's edited back together again. Now, is this an implicit kind of acknowledgement that there's a bit of creative commons to these kind of works? You know, like, look, you're covering my... I don't know if it's an implicit acknowledgement or an explicit selection of the creative commons drop-down in the YouTube submission tool. Yeah, I, I got to imagine a lot of these people probably... But you know, if you're the guy who wrote the song and you yeah. can be able to give a takedown notice or a performance royalty out of all of this, that you probably aren't worried about them sending a takedown notice back at you. Yeah, well, especially if you're making the fight. This is how messy it is, man. I don't know. It's crazy. But this is this is a very cool development. You just play the exact same thing. You just come down and you stop. Just like that. <laughs> This is ridiculous. Nobody can play a whole guitar by themselves. All right, so Ian writes, dudes, I'm a cord cutter from a suburb of Houston. I have to say building your own antenna is easy, and it only cost me $2. I live over 30 miles from an antenna farm, and I get everything on my antenna that consists of a strand from an RCA cable thumbtacked to my wall. I have zero line of sight to the antennas. The hardest thing was finding the website that showed the formula determining how long you had uh, how long the top had to be to pick up the VHS PBS station. All the fancy fractal designs they say you need are unnecessary. And thankfully, because it was so difficult for him to find out how, he gave us a helpful website to get that information. Oh, wait, no, he didn't. He just told us how hard it was and how awesome he was for doing it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, finish up. We had a lot of people wrote in and say, hey, Tom, why are you so mad about Hulu Plus? Hulu Plus gives me full seasons of old TV shows. Hulu Plus allows me uh, to watch things that I can't watch otherwise. It's totally worth the eight bucks. They have the Criterion Collection in there. Uh, to all you folks, yes, you made some great points. I should have been clear. There are things in Hulu Plus that are not available in Hulu. What bothers me is not those things. That all makes sense. What bothers me is that there are things available in Hulu that aren't available as a Hulu Plus subscriber, and one in particular, Warehouse 13, show I love. Uh, it's not spoiler time yet. Warehouse 13, I, as you can see, I'm not logged in, so I'm not in my Hulu Plus account. I can watch the past three, two seasons, seasons three and four, full seasons of Warehouse 13 on Hulu.com. I don't have to pay anything. For Hulu Plus, but it says if I want to watch these on my mobile device, that I, you know, I, I should pay for Hulu Plus. I mean, that's Hulu says if you want to watch things on your mobile device, pay for Hulu Plus. When I go to Hulu Plus on my tablet and log in and search for Warehouse 13, it says, oh, these are only available on the web. Tom, it's really hard. I don't know if there's something messed up with the Skype signal. I, I could see your lips moving, but like all I heard was, well. It's just a weird Skype artifacting. I mean, it's like, look, dude, it's their content. They get to decide. No, how no, you want no. To I, I, Brian, I'm not trying to complain anymore. I'm trying to explain my complaint. People are okay. saying you're not. You're complaining about so you're misinformed. I'm not misinformed. <clears throat> there is something that I get for free that I can't get by paying for. In other words, I'm restricted. It's like love. I'm restricted from getting it by paying for it. All right. I pay I, for a service and then I can't get it. Andy sounded like he had something to say, and I want to hear Andy instead of you. Go ahead, Andy. I said, it, I said it's like love. You can't it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, no, I was just trying to, to correct the misimpression that I didn't understand how, how Hulu worked. I do understand. Right, let's go ahead and wrap things up. If you guys want to send us an email, it's framerate at twit.tv. We love you guys. We're going to stick around and talk about Breaking Bad in the spoiler zone. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can email us framerate at twit.tv or give us a call. No, you can't give us a call, but you can, you can leave us uh, those email messages, and you can find yes. us on demand at twit.tv slash fr anytime you want. We're live on Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Andy Armstrong, for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Congratulations again, man. Fantastic.
All right, Andy, I know it's super late, so we'll uh, we'll let you go if you need to, to get to sleep. We don't want to spoil Breaking Bad for you anyway. Yes, you yeah. like to watch Breaking Bad, and you want to talk about those last few episodes. Yeah, I guess we'll get that in the UK in about five years. So I, I, I... <laughs> Fair enough, man. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, congratulations. Fantastic work by all accounts. Yeah, well done. Anytime. Great show. See you again. All right, Take thanks, care. Andy. Okay, seriously, Tom, how many episodes has it been since we've done spoilers on? We've got like four episodes of catching up to do, and they were all amazing for very different reasons. Yeah, I, I can't, I, I definitely will not be able to tell you what happened in any given episode. Like, I can't keep it all straight. It's just one running storyline to me, which is what I love about Breaking Bad the whole time, right? Uh, oh my God. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, the. Biggest thing I remember hearing before I saw the episode was people being like, wow, Walter White is definitely not a good guy now. And it's like, well, no, did you miss did you miss how it ended last last season? Yeah. But uh, they certainly spent an entire episode really focusing on the dark manipulation and, and that whole theme of Skylar feeling as a trapped hostage in this relationship and seeing no way out and the chess game they play when she's like, well, maybe I'll just beat my face and talk about how you beat me. And he's like, well, maybe I'll freaking slit your throat or, you know, it's like, it's like it, it gets super dark and you see how trapped and embroiled all of them are. And you know, none of this is going to end up well. Uh, Skylar has become much more uh, understandable. Yeah. I've, Look at it from her perspective, and I can see how she feels trapped, and she wants one thing, for the children to be safe, right? Weirdly, I can see it from Walter's point of view, where it's like, hey, man, doesn't matter how we got here. This is where we're at now. And you know what I don't want to do? Go back to being a chump working at a uh, freaking high school. I want to keep on rolling forward. What I love wow. is... That's well, not what he said this most recent episode. I just want to keep on rolling forward. He said, I want to build an empire. Did he say that? Did yeah. I miss that? This Man. isn't about money, Skyler. This is about emp an empire. I think he had a taste of respect and being on top. And I think that's a very seductive thing to someone like Walter White. Well, what's, what, yeah, what's happening with Walter is that he is leaving the, the, the realm of, well, I probably would never do that. But I can see the logic in what he's doing. I can see the motivation. He, he's leaving that. He's yes. going into, like, no, that's not okay land. Uh, and that's why you're seeing more and more people every week going, wait, I thought Walter used to be a good guy, but now he's not anymore. And we're all like, no, we've, we've been pointing that way. But he goes farther every week. And, and what's really interesting to me is his justification for this the entire time, and still today, has been, I'm doing this for my family, and he's yeah. lost his family. Yes. He hasn't yes. quite lost yes. his son yet, but... The baby is out of his control now, and Skyler's yes. going to do her darndest to keep the baby away from him. Skyler's not part. He Skyler is under protest. She, he's lost Skyler though, for all intents and purposes. And and the son is just confused. He still has the son, but barely. He doesn't really have a family to protect anymore. In fact, Skyler's the one who's doing the wise things to protect the family at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's talk about this most recent episode. I don't think we've seen a single episode like this in all of Breaking Bad. Actually, I take that back. Um, you sort of saw a heist element to that Magnet episode, but I love that it was a straight-up heist. It was a novel impl uh, implementation of it, uh, and what a twist at the end, man. It's like, just as they're high-fiving, I thought... Um, Man, they uh, didn't they start off with, like, a kid? And they don't usually spend, like, three minutes on something and then just throw it away. Shouldn't there be a kid right about now? And yeah. then right as I was thinking, like, oh, crap balls. What if that kid saw the... And then, sure enough, I mean, it was like... Uh, and also what they did, setting up Todd, where Todd seemed like somebody who kind of got what was going on and wanted to be interested. But I, the whole time I'm seeing Todd in those two episodes... I'm thinking, I don't know if he's really got it. He doesn't seem to have gangster in him, and maybe he's in over his head. Are they going to kill Todd because he's not hardcore enough? And then, boy, was I wrong. It was well, the exact that's, opposite That's direction. the funny thing, right? We keep calling him Landry because he played Landry on Friday Night Lights, uh, but it's the same actor. And, and Todd, we thought, oh, Todd's meat, right? 
He's because mm-hmm. they've been t- saying all this stuff about no witnesses, no witnesses, and they keep showing him. And you're like, wow, this guy, he, he's asking all the wrong questions. And Walter's looking at him. And you think at the end when they high five, I'm like, is Walter going to dispose of Todd now? And I had, unlike you, I had totally forgotten about the kid on the bicycle. Like, oh, really? it, it had left my mind. And so as soon as the kid rolled up, I'm like, of course. Yeah. But still, at that point, I didn't think it was going to be Todd that, that took him down. Well, and without hesitation as well. It's like Todd knew the Todd knew, knows the score better than either of the guys. The, there are the, the themes that I'm loving right now is I'm loving watching Walter's descent into more and more madness and more and more depravity. Uh, and um, uh, or I guess moral depravity would be the way to put it. Uh, I, Aaron Paul as Pinkman is, I love that he's the idea man now. That he keeps coming up with these crazy out-of-the-box scenarios to make stuff happen. Um uh, I, I I like Skyler much more after she made a play to get the kids out of the house. And uh, and weirdly, this is the one I never thought I'd say, I really am liking Hank uh stepping into his role as boss now. I think it's it's he's he started off as such kind of a buffoon, a jackass jerk, but now it's like I find him I, I kind of want him to 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 make the big score and what and you- figure out who's you know to solve the case what's interesting about hank i feel like his character is the kind of character we we see a lot in real life which is the Mm -hmm. guy who's really good at his job and maybe you meet him in the workplace and you're like wow this guy's got it all together he's he's smart he's capable he he commands the meeting you know he's always getting promoted and then you meet him outside of work in his home life and he's just inept like maybe his boss, his maybe his spouse, his or her spouse bosses them around, or maybe they just there's just not their 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 homes a wreck or something, and you're like this person is only good at work. They're just uh, this is work is their life, and I think that's Hank. And through most of the seasons, all we've got to see of Hank is his home life because of the injury, right? So yes. and, and because of his relationship with Walt. So we only got glimpses of the FBI stuff in the early days, and then it got limited because of his injury. And now, not only is he back, but he's back in charge. We're getting to see Hank shine at what he does well. Yes, yes. Uh, and well, and also, uh, I really dug seeing those scenes where it's like this sort of painted picture of what might be with uh, Hank and Marie keeping the kids. And, uh, you know, even if, even if, even though they're having trouble with Walt Jr., uh, just seeing them play family weirdly was engaging to me. I don't know. It was something that I didn't expect to see, and I enjoyed it. I also enjoyed the bugging scene. I, man, they're they're just killing it, and it's and it's breaking my heart that they essentially only have this last season split into two pieces to go. But it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, it really is. How how good are these actors, uh, especially Walt? Well, Everyone is good, except for the fact that Walt Jr. is clearly like 35 now. I think he's like yeah, two well, years. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's one of those things where it's like you, you, you always got that problem with child actors, right? If, if, you're, yeah. if your series takes longer to shoot than the time passing in the tale you're telling. Lost was the same way. Uh, yeah, and I remember they wrote it in the Lost. Like they actually wrote it in. Like he looked weird. He looked older. Yeah, they had time. to come up with something like, oh yeah, it was a uh, time travel. Uh, that's what it was. And I wonder if, because you notice, you know, obviously they're throwing Walt Jr. out of the house. I wonder if that is trying to write him out of the episodes more, so we don't have to keep looking at him, wondering why he's clearly a, a grown ass man. Yeah, he's integral though, and and you know, I don't know, maybe he just uh, matured fast. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Well, sure. Why not? <laughs> Only sixteen. He's just big and hairy for being a sixteen year old. Right. 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 You know, so also, it, it looks weirder as he gets older. Uh, does the act, the actor himself? I assume doesn't have cerebral palsy, right? Yeah, he does. Oh, he does really? Yeah. Uh, well, at Comic Con, he he. He he wasn't pretending to be Walt Jr. I don't think. Well, so I wonder if I wonder if uh, as he has grown and matured, like you've seen the symptoms of it actually diminish. So I wonder if in his personal life he's he's. Uh, I, I, I think man, it's, this, this is fascinating. Uh, I, and I, I don't know what exactly is what his. I you know I, I want to be careful of getting into the saying. Oh, he has cerebral palsy. I don't know. What is wrong? Right. What he has? Uh, Bill Meeks um, in the chat room, that trustworthy soul who brought us the Doctor Who story from last week, is telling us that is it isn't as severe as the characters. Well, and see- I was going to say at Comic Con, it did not seem terribly severe, and I think it may be a, a, a situation where early 
in the series, they they told him to accentuate it and really, you know, play it up. And now they're needing him to do more complex things, have more complex lines, and it just doesn't work for him to to struggle with it as much. So he's he's acting more normal for him. Well, that's awesome, man. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right, that's it for the Spoiler Zone. Thanks, everybody. Uh, if you stuck around, don't forget you can find us at twit.tv slash FR. We'll see you later.